ऑल राइट सो वी बिगिन नाउ ठीक है सो लास्ट टाइम कहाँ हमने ऐड किया था इफ आई वट जस्ट गो ओवर क्विकली द लास्ट फ्यू क्लासेस लास्ट क्लासेस स्लाइड्स जस्ट टू गिव अ री कैप एंड यही जो मैं नोट्स लिख रहा हूँ ना आई विल अपलोड द वीडियो फॉर टूडेज क्लास एंड लास्ट क्लास एंड दीज नोट्स आफ्टर क्लास ऑन वट यू कॉल इट ट्राइब द माइटी नेटवर्क राइट सो वी स्टार्ट ऑफ फ्रॉम द फैक्ट के यार हमें पता है कि क्या है uh we start we we started to isolate redox reactions and to do that we made something called electrochemical cells they were made up of half cells we took the zinc and copper example and what was a half cell it was a full electrochemical cell is made up of two half cells and uh, in the real world we want to compare them so we talked about standard half cells where the concentration is one mole per dm cube and we got a, a full cell contains two half cells and you can put a salt bridge you need that and each half cell has a corresponding half equation which is basically an equilibrium between the two redox states of the uh element involved in there we saw that then we left it at this the repeating the same thing again which was the how to make a full cell and there are two things that are intertwined in this now that we're going to start the next thing the two the two things that we want to focus on is the idea of individual half cells which actually because if you notice the half cells were an equilibrium between two oxidation states or something they were literally that they were half or they were basically equilibrium between two oxidation states and there was a way for us to figure out which oxidation state is more preferred and which is more likely to happen and uh, the idea was that when we connect these two half cells they actually became a full cell and the reason why there was a, a cell is because there was current flowing and why is this current flow because there is a potential difference between the two half cells that means that one half cell had more electrons on the rod than the other half cell that's what we had so i'm going to take a diagram of this and uh, uh let me get the diagram here for you if you guys don't mind it's a very beautiful diagram i hope i can show it to you guys yes i can so now we we're going to start huh yeah okay this is quite beautiful hai na it's in a black background this is copper solution on yeah, the right yeah. hand side it's a beaker so you can see the 3d beaker and this is copper strip hence colored a little orangish purplish pinkish sorry oranges and salt bridge is a best a tube huh pink solid yeah but in real life me is like brownish orangish brown ho jata hai because of oxid slight oxidation it's copper colored yes thank you yes and this solution is some form of copper salt we either tend to take nitrates or sulfates because they are the ones that are generally most soluble and on the left hand side is a zinc half cell zinc strip and sevai copper and gold ke uh, copper is cop pink in color gold is golden color every other metal is very silvery metal in color and that metal dipped in a solution and generally unless it's a transition metal ion they are colorless and zinc is really a non transition metal ion we'll talk about that when we do transition elements but zinc is a colorless solution and the reason what we had discovered was that what we once this because you see first i've got to explain this to you in terms of what we discovered and then what color is silver oh asif let me guess purple yeah anyway so ha huh. so i'm going to tell you what we discovered and once we know what we discovered then you can make predictions on basis of what we discovered okay now the way this works was that the reason we figured kr electrons are actually going from zinc to copper that's what we saw the reason why they were going was they were definitely going from an uh, area of higher electron charge to an area of lower electron charge meaning the moment we connected this the moment we connected this we saw electrons go this way 
That means the moment before connection, the electrons on zinc rod, which I'm showing you outside of the zinc rod, would have to be more than the electrons on the copper rod. Because if there were more electrons on the copper rod, they would have gone from an area of higher electron density to an area of lower electron density. But what we discovered was they were actually going from zinc to copper, which meant that before the uh, wire was even set, the zinc had more electrons on its metal than copper. Now, understand that we started them at the same point. We didn't have a difference. Zinc and zinc's equilibrium was an equilibrium between zinc's electrons and zinc metal. And copper's equilibrium was between copper and copper metal. Like, for example, copper ions and copper metal. So, kahani ye hai ke before the wire is connected, both of these are what we call half cells. Both are ions and uh, the metal in equilibrium. Ion and metal in equilibrium. But using deductive reasoning, okay, if I connect these this with a wire, and knowing that electrons went from here to here implied that there were more electrons on zinc than on copper. And this is important for you to understand. That was a signal. This electrons going from here to here told us that there were more electrons on the zinc electrode than there were on the copper electrode. Which implied that when I look at these two equations, if I had to do a comparative analysis between these two equations, it would have to be that zinc was lying more to the left than copper was. Because both are producing two electrons. But if there were more electrons on zinc than copper, which meant that the first equation went more backwards than the second, or where the equilibrium lied more towards the left for zinc than it did for copper. That's what I'm saying. So what this electron, electrons moving this way, proved that the zinc equilibrium lied more not this lied, right? It lay more to the left, not lied, lay more to the left hand side. Yeah. Following so far? Yeah. Yes. One second. Mm. Okay, sorry. Uh, notability. Notability, yeah, I, I'm using this because I want to make these into notes and give you guys these notes. So hence I'm using notability. So basically, Kani ye hai ke in addition to a cell being having its own use, which is yaar, voltage nikal rahi hai, current aa hai, aur hume kaam bhot hoga iska, wo to hai. The point is that it was also an indicator of the position of the equilibrium. Like it was very obvious to us that the zinc equilibrium lied more to the left than coppers, which tends to also mean something in, in actual terms. It means that zinc rather be an ion more than coppers desire to be an ion. If, 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 if that was the, see, understand how this connects to your reactivity series. Because the electrons went this way, and I'm repeating it because it's asked so many times this chapter to revise. I want to make sure you guys get it, and you are not the ones asking me for revision. So, the idea is that when we connected the cell, electrons went from zinc to copper. What that told me was that there were more electrons on zinc than on the copper electrode. Which tells me that zinc's equilibrium lies more to the left than copper's equilibrium. What that means is, between the two states of zinc, the ion is preferred for zinc. Or, between the two of them, zinc wants to go backwards more, which means between the two metals. Remember, the metals are the unionized ones. Between the zinc metal and the copper metal, the zinc metal tends to ionize more. Which is why zinc is, you've learned zinc to be above copper in the reactivity series. Because zinc was literally the guy who wants to be more reactive. And then you can use this to actually explain almost all of the reactivity series. That's the first, that's the actual use for this. The other is to actually understand what's going on in the cell. 
So the two things I want to, when we'll talk about is that one was this and then the cell. And um, we'll talk about the cell in more detail also. We will. I want to talk to you guys about another uh, cell. One second. Oh, come on. So, now imagine I did the same thing with uh, mm, what? So, Ekto, the two things I was saying, na, we'll have to remember, is that we need to understand that there'll be a potential difference between these guys. Okay? And the moment you connect it, the moment you connect it, they no longer are going to be in equilibrium. Before that, they were, but the moment after you connect it, they will not be in equilibrium. They will actually take sides. If one is, one is favored backward, it'll actually go backward. And it'll actually go in this case, Zinc will become what? Zinc will go backwards and zinc will become zinc 2 plus ion and 2 electrons. And copper 1 will go forwards. Now, how do we know which goes forward, which goes backward? There will be another way to predict it. But till we know how to predict it, if we are told electrons go from one to the other, just follow that. If they are going from zinc to copper, that means copper is gaining electrons. Then copper will have to move to the side to as to as to oppose that change so if i'm giving electrons to copper it will have to shift right to decrease that and on the other hand if zinc is giving electrons then its own electrons are decreasing so if the own electrons are decreasing the only way to oppose that change is by making more by going backward so both half equation half cells will take a stand as to which side of the half equation they move to and you'll realize that once they have to decide, one of them will have to lose electrons, the other one will have to gain electrons, and the one that loses is called oxidation, and the one that gains it is called reduction. Now at school, how much have you guys done by the way? Just asking. I know, I always ask the most fun questions. Like, hello? We were doing Mm. Yeah, so that's what we're doing today. Okay, okay, awesome. Okay, so hmm, kahanta? Now, huh? Then reduction, huh? What also you need to remember is that you also have to have a half cell. So now, once you've done the two half equations, by the way, the two half equations, if added up, will represent the full reaction represented by the full cell. So if you take the two half equations, you add them by balancing electrons. In this particular case, the electrons seem to be already balanced. And you add this up, you're going to get the full equation for the reaction. That this so this full equation represents the reaction taking place. But now we also have a voltmeter reading. So we know that this thing has a potential, this reaction creates a potential difference of 1.1 volts under standard conditions. Standard conditions. conditions yeah and uh, basically this is the emf of the cell and we the, we use the symbol e to 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 represent this value but if it's done at standard conditions it's called e naught so e naught is the symbol when this is happening at standard conditions which happen to be 1 mole per dm cube solution now, on top of that, I've got to go back here for a second and talk about the salt bridge for a second. Now, what, and this is something that I need you guys to pay attention, though it's not really a uh, very detailed ask in the exam. But understand that the moment you are going to have a solution of zinc, you're also going to have anions. Let's say it's may sulfate anions. Te. So you had equal amounts of zinc and sulfate anions in the solution. And on the right-hand side, you have equal amounts of copper and sulfate ions. 
and the reason why i'm saying equal amounts is because the net charge of both solutions is neutral because you can only make a solution by taking a whole compound so this area the zinc area has what do we call zinc has a zinc and zinc and sulfate ions this has copper and sulfate ions now when i had said that when the cell is connected electrons flow when the electrons flow zinc has taken a side and copper has taken a side it means zinc is lose zinc is creating more ions and more electrons while copper is absorbing the extra electrons to becoming metal now when both of these reactions take place they are going to affect the solution also how imagine if the left one starts happening more and more when it happens more and more what starts to be formed in addition to the electrons the electrons flow through the wire so we don't care about them but the zinc ions start to be formed in the solution the problem is the solution can't have a build up of charge because because there has to be a complete flow of charge now there, if there's a build up of charge it will start to disrupt this equilibrium again by pushing it backwards so the idea is for us to can successfully run this cell we have to prevent the build up of charge and why would there be a build up of charge because you're adding an extra positive ion or positive ions in the solution so there's a build up of plus charge here due to the fact that you are creating more zinc ions on the right hand side copper ions from the solution start becoming copper which means first of all the electrode will get bigger but the ions in the solution will get less and less and the and the ions if they were to want be on their own i have no problem but the ion the cat ions are along with an ions make a neutral solution and if the cat ions decrease the solution becomes more negative so what has happening is the moment you connect the wire the solution on the left hand side has a build up of plus charge the solution on the right hand side has a build up of negative charge and how do you prevent that you do you want to prevent this build up of charge so the way to prevent that is to have easily available aqueous ions that can go into the system what that means is if you realize that on the left hand side there's a build up of plus charge the only way to to diffuse the plus charge build up is to be able to pass in negative ions through this when needed and why would it be attracted because when the solution is net positive it'll attract the negative ions stuck here in towards itself and i'm telling you that here we have a reservoir of aqueous positive and negative ions to jab chahiye honge they'll go in here first let me repeat zinc became ions so there was a build up of plus charge those plus charge ions are going to attract the negative ions from this pipe called the salt bridge on the right hand side copper was decreasing which meant that the solution was becoming more negative how can i neutralize this negative build up of charge by flowing in positive ions so if you have a neutral solution here in this salt bridge it can provide positive ions to a negative build up of charge and provide negative ions to a positive build up of charge so the purpose of the salt bridge which is what you need to know for the exam it completes the circuit by preventing the build up of charge on either half cell how does it do that by providing aqueous ions and we tend to make salt bridges from the most soluble ions because we don't want the salt bridge to be causing any precipitation the best way to make an uh, salt bridge is to take group 1 nitrates so salt bridge could be a, a tube that has a group 1 nitrate solution why group 1 nitrate because all group 1s are soluble and all nitrates are soluble and mustafa joining us thank you mustafa hi mustafa mustafa how you are mustafa so yes so we tend to like potassium nitrate a lot or sodium nitrate why because they tend to not precipitate something anything and they help prevent this build up of charge okay 
सो ना दिस वॉज वन सेल ठीक है लेट्स टेक अ लुक एन अनदर वन ना इट आई एम टेकिंग द सेम सेल गेन बट आई एम नॉट एक्चुअली टेकिंग द सेम सेल बिकॉज आई डेंट हैदर डायग्राम सो आई एम एक्चुअली टेकिंग आई एक्सप्लेन टू वट आई एम टेकिंग आई एम गोन बी टेकिंग एन नॉट जिंक is not zinc and this is not a solution of zinc what i'm going to talk about is now i'll take magnesium so i tell you that this is a magnesium strip and this solution is magnesium nitrate aqueous obviously when i have aqueous magnesium nitrate it'll give me 1 mole per dm cube magnesium aqueous ions theek hai now what am i doing here i'm doing is that i'm now going to calculate what uh yeah so now how would this look if magnesium is connected to copper and not copper connected to magnesium so to not to give away the surprise so i'm going to delete this first this copper fellow the equation at least and talk about the fact that when we connected this what we discovered was again that the electrons were going from magnesium to copper now on the left hand side we have what we call a magnesium half cell it is magnesium ribbon in a solution of its ions which means that it would have a half equation which that would look like this mg2 plus plus 2 electrons becoming mg and the right hand side was copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons becoming copper now these are half equations that representing the equilibrium in these two half cells but the moment i connect the two half cells what i see is that current electrons are flowing from magnesium to copper but what's 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 different about this versus zinc is that the potential difference in this particular case came out to 2.62 volts and if you apply basic o level thinking the reason why they have a greater potential difference is because there is a greater difference in reactivity between magnesium and copper than it is between magnesium and zinc now also this tells us that hey there were more electrons on this rod than there were on a copper rod for sure but because the potential difference was even more than zinc i can predict that there were even more electrons on magnesium than there were on zinc and we could have actually proved that by actually setting up magnesium and zinc half cell also but that became too much so let's abhi ke liye hum ye dekhte hain ki i can i can literally do this i can set up everything against copper here in this case i am setting up magnesium against copper what i realize is that because the electrons are going from magnesium to copper this equilibrium would have to go left to produce more electrons and since copper is getting more electrons this equilibrium will have to go right to accept the extra electrons while magnesium has to produce extra electrons now that means that the if this is the overall reaction the individual half reactions were copper getting reduced and magnesium getting oxidized so this is reduction and that is oxidation all right and and so i knew ke between magnesium and zinc the direction was the same everything else seemed to happen the same magnesium got oxidized like zinc got oxidized but in this case copper got reduced but what i what i realized the difference was the potential difference so by looking at this potential difference i could have made a prediction that magnesium wanted to make more ions than even zinc which which is why magnesium is a more reactive metal than zinc so basically it's this kind of setup that we actually used to get a reactivity series otherwise we would not have had a reactivity series it's actually this kind of setup that got us a reactivity series but to get a series we'd have to compare either everything with everything else also which will be too many comparisons or we compare everything with one guy now in my last two examples i have compared zinc with copper and now magnesium with copper so if i were to summarize that i in my zinc okay bad color don't like this too flashy so between a zinc zinc 
between a zinc, a zinc two plus, and copper co two copper two plus cells. May we got the electromotive force of that cell to be one point one zero volts. That just is a measure of the force per coulomb. And the currents. This was the negative electrode. Copper was the positive, meaning electrons are going from zinc to copper. When it is the same for magnesium and magnesium two plus ions versus copper, that the E of that reaction was two point six two volts, and magnesium was negative and copper was positive, and electrons are going from zinc to sorry magnesium to copper. First of all, if electrons are going from zinc to copper, magnesium to copper, they were both more reactive than copper. But between the two, magnesium was more reactive because it has a higher E value, which tends to mean that it has a higher potential difference because it had more electrons built up here than even zinc did, which meant it was more reactive than zinc. Now, zinc, magnesium. If I were to do this with silver, I'd get a similar example. Uh, silver, potassium. If every metal that you've studied is compared against copper, we could get a value for all of these, and this will help us to actually put them in an order of reactivity. But life couldn't be that simple, obviously, right? If it is, if it was, then wouldn't we love it? So somebody said, you know what? No, no, no. I don't want to make standards against copper because if I had did done this right now, I'm just doing it as I'm making copper the standard. But they said, no, 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 no. We can't have copper the standard. How dare we? We have to be the, taking the Bible of standard, which is the hydrogen. So we said, let's take hydrogen as a standard. Now the problem is, but I like to talk about it because right now, so far, you have seen half cells that include two oxidation state forms, like in this case, magnesium ka plus two and zero state hai. Copper wali mein again plus two and zero state tha. But so far, you have been able to get away with one of the two states being aqueous ions and the other one being metal solid. And we call them redox half cells. Uh, before we discuss this, uh, the equilibrium, sorry, equilibrium kya kero? standard, we should also talk about half cells. Now, what are half cells of other kinds? So the most basic half cell that we've seen is a metal half cell. It's basically the most basic that you've seen is a metal half cell. Hota kya usme? Usme ek beaker hota hai. Thik hai. Usme ek hum ek metal lalte hai. Or metal hi electrode hota hai. Because it has to pass current. And it has a, it's full of a solution. Basically, and a standard version of writing this is that, why is there a dot there? One second. Let me do this again. You guys are so quiet. It's like, dude, like, like I'm teaching at 8 in the morning at school. And this is metal X plus aqueous. Metal aqueous ion. Meaning, you can use this for uh, iron. This is iron. This is Fe2 plus aqueous. Now, obviously, that will represent its own half equation. Fe2 plus plus 2E becoming Fe. So, every half cell will be representing a half equation. But, it doesn't have to just be Fe2 plus. It could have been equally like Fe3 plus. And we can, that would be a different cell. Obviously, the color will also be different to the solutions. You know, Fe2 plus is green, while Fe3 plus is red brown. But this half cell would be Fe3 plus plus three electrons becoming Fe. And these are all what we call half cells. Metal dipped in a solution of its ions and there will be the aqueous form of the ion and the metal form. And you're finding the equilibrium between these. That's what a half cell is. Any questions so far?
Hmm? Everybody? Yes. That's not a question. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. But it is not only true to have a metal and a, yeah, an, an aqueous ion. Huh, you need a metal to be able to store electrons to pass current. But you don't have to have the whole uh, half cell have a metal. Meaning, you could have made a half cell between any two oxidation states of any element. Meaning, you could also have had an oxidation, a half cell between the two oxidation states of I hydrogen, which are plus one and zero. And if you had to deduce the half equations for this, this would be this. So either H plus plus E becoming H2, half H2, or 2H plus plus 2E becoming H2. And this is a half equation between the two different oxidation, st uh, oxidation states of hydrogen. But in this case, we don't have a solid, we have a gas. So for that, we have a very special, special, special human being. No, a special half cell, not a human being. And that is a standard hydrogen half cell. And the way that looks is like this. It's in the notes also, but I'm pasting it here too. Where you have a beaker which is pretty obvious by this diagram. Yeah. You have a beaker, and in that beaker you have H plus ions through acid. And then you have this jar that you pass hydrogen gas through. And the reason to do that is that in the solution you want both bubbles of hydrogen gas and the aqueous ion. Because that's the only place you can establish this equilibrium. Between the ion and the, and the gas, they have to meet each other. Okay. They have to meet each other. But you cannot just store electrons anywhere. You have to be able to store electrons on a metal rod. So we take the most, the least reactive metal to just store electrons between the two oxidation states of hydrogen. And obviously the metal, metal electrode has to have a wire connected so that this half cell can be connected to anything else to measure the potential difference. And that's what we do. We take this half cell, connect it across multiple half cells to find the potential difference of all of those half cells. Instead of using copper like I use in my example, we are gonna use hydrogen. And the way this works is, you have hydrogen gas continuously supplied, comes down here. In this, in this region, basically it is in equilibrium with hydrogen ions. And that, uh, that hydrogen gas gives off electrons to form hydrogen ions while hydrogen ions gain electrons to become hydrogen gas again. And you have to have a continuous supply because you have to maintain a certain pressure which is one atmosphere because the standard pressure is one atmosphere. Yeah? Then we have that. Uh... I'm going to erase this because, you know what, it's just going to ruin it in your notes. So this is called a standard hydrogen electrode. And each half cell is actually an electrode. So this is a standard hydrogen half cell, also known as the standard hydrogen electrode. And what we do is, we take this fellow and we measure everything against this fellow. That's the goal. We want to make everything measure against this fellow. And because it is standard, understand that if there is solution, the concentration has to be one mole per dm cube. And if it's a gas, it has to be one atmosphere pressure. And obviously, the temperature has to always be 298 Kelvin, and else we can't call it standard. And what we do is, instead of we comparing everything to zinc or copper, we compare everything to hydrogen, including zinc and copper. Like this.
Nine seconds. Why can't I see the image? Oh, there you go. What is this bullshit? So now, here is basically a standard hydrogen electrode connected into a zinc half cell or a hydrogen half cell, which let's highlight this for a second. This is your standard hydrogen electrode, which is basically a beaker of acid and hydrogen gas being bubbled through. And it's the platinum square. If you notice that, that's a square electrode there only just to facilitate the electron transfer. And there's a half equation that is representing this half electrode, half cell. That equation is uh, hydrogen ions. Again, the oxidized form first, gaining electrons to become the reduced form. You can write it like this, or you can write it as H plus plus E becoming half H2. It doesn't matter how you write it in which form. But on the right hand side, left hand side, we had zinc in a solution of its ions. And that's zinc metal in a solution of its ions. That makes this a zinc electrode or a zinc half cell. And you connect that across and you have to have a salt bridge. And when we do connect it, what we have, and because obviously there's a Z zinc EB half equation, eh? which is zinc 2 plus plus 2 becoming zinc. And remember, every half cell will have a half equation, which will be the two different oxidation states of the element, where the more positive one written first, gaining electrons to become the less positive one. And once you connect the wire, the two equilibriums have to take sides. One will have to go forward, one will have to go backward. In this particular case, what we discovered used, that's why these signs exist minus and plus. What I'm telling you we saw was electrons moving from zinc to hydrogen, which meant that there were more electrons on zinc than there were on the hydrogen electrode. And if, if they're going from zinc to hydrogen, it meant that the zinc's equilibrium equation was shifted back. Therefore, hydrogen have to shift forward because zinc would have to continuously lose electrons to keep passing the electrons. So the actual reaction taking place here was zinc becoming zinc two plus ions, while the other half equation would be, let's say hydrogen ions plus electron becoming half hydrogen gas. And obviously this would be oxidation and the right hand side would be reduction. And the potential difference in this case was point seven six volts potential difference is the potential huh, it's basically that is what we're going to start measuring we are going to start measuring the potential difference between this and between zinc and other guys so we'll connect everything to a hydrogen electrode and we start measuring its potential difference and so we make a whole table of about like almost everything that is has an oxidation state change is therefore measured against hydrogen so that every redox reaction ka, we can quantify it in terms of its potential difference. And so the potential difference will tell us which state is reactive and how is it reactive. Which elements will undergo oxidation, which will undergo reduction. And that's what we're going to do on Friday now. Okay. Any questions for this guys?